director, Jane Kahn, and let's give a big hand. I'm so happy that um, JJ and Duncan and Richard are here uh, because um, the fantastic people. This film is so valuable as a kind of primer for a mass population. This is, yes, the bottom line of your film, James. You have interwoven here really outstanding viewpoints of pioneers in the field who've been there for many, many years and realize this is a, a tapestry, a mosaic of all of us the rediscovering that we are not alone, but we are part of a greater family. Richard wrote a book called UFOs and National Security State, two volumes, he's working on his third volume. He's also written a book called After Disclosure, AD, After Disclosure. Like, what will be the consequences when this information comes forward and it's shared publicly by government officials? And he's working on a new book called UFOs in the for the 21st Century Mind, which will be a real great primer for all your, the people out there who have relatives and you tell them about this and they say, yeah, right. This is the book. <laughs> this is the book, this is why he wrote this book because um, we know it, but there's a lot of people there who say, yeah, show me, but it's, it's so vast the topic that you need to just give them something and say, here, read this. Okay, now we have my good friend, Duncan Cameron, who's world-renowned, yes. If you thought the movie was interesting, Duncan has had experiences that are beyond anything we can imagine, and um, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit, if you're sure. comfortable. <laughs> or not. And, um, and so, when we meet the other, it's not like you're going to sit around and have coffee with these beings. I mean, why do you pick up on that, Richard? Because you and, and, and talking about the UFO mind and talking about the way society needs to adjust to the uh, disclosure contact process. Sure. Well, I think that uh, we're, we really struggle to, uh, to grasp what we're dealing with. And that's one of the reasons why there still hasn't been this open acknowledgement, because uh, we, we just, I don't think that we're operating on the level that these other beings are operating on. They deal with us, it seems to me, on the terms that they, they choose, uh, by and large. And, um, you know, one thing that I've noticed in speaking with quite a number of people who have had, I, what I think are genuine experiences with these other beings, is that they're, they are traumatized. It's not always an awful, awful experience, but um, I'll just give you a couple of generic examples that are totally true. Um, a woman who um, had an experience 40 years ago, she's a highly uh, sophisticated, accomplished lady, a prominent writer, and had not spoken to anybody for 40 years about what she had experienced until I got to speak to her. And uh, she started hyperventilating two minutes into our discussion. And her heart started racing, and about five times I had to say, just slow down, slow down, slow down. And it took a long time to get through it. Another guy that I interviewed, a truck driver, had an experience 30 years before, same thing. And he had not spoken to anyone. Um, when they start reliving what they dealt with, it's so difficult for them to talk about this. They've gone through something that they don't really know how to process. They've not felt that they could speak to other people about this, not spouses, not even best friends frequently. And so it's so they 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 dealt with something, and there are others as well, of course, who've dealt with things that are uh, beyond what we're normally accustomed to dealing with in our, our waking life. And um, so I think about like I when I was uh, trying to puzzle through this whole after disclosure scenario, uh, one of the things I kept running into was how how would um, this affect our whole culture if if it comes out and admitted what many of us already know, which is that there are these others that are here. And um, I, I, I can't but, but think it would be an utterly revolutionary kind of event in our culture. Like nothing we've ever seen before. Like, no, like, yeah. I mean, you know, we thought, think about the JFK assassination, we think of 9-11, and I think this, this would be, I mean, really, without minute diminishing those, this would be beyond that. It would re redefine who we are, and then it would also reinforce the point that there, 
we're, we're not at the top of our food chain. Uh, not that they're here to eat us, but that there, there are other beings who have got significant advances over we in so many ways. Uh, we're, we're really, I don't think that we're really at the level or as a society in general that we're ready to deal with with this reality, but that's not going to stop it from happening. That's the whole thing. It's like, I often feel like no parent's ever ready for their first child, but that doesn't stop the child from coming. And, you know, uh, but boom, there it is. And then you have to just roll with it. You have to learn, you have to deal with it. And uh, this this is going to happen. And we, most people, we all have family, we all have relatives, and we know they're not all on the kind of page that we're on. Uh, they live in a totally different reality. And uh, I ask myself, in our society, are there any th things in our society, our culture, our politics, our media, that are getting us ready for that? And I think, not really. But it's going to happen. This is an inevitability. So it'll be a tremendous shock. I think a lot of people will be kind of traumatized by the new reality, but I think many people will do well, That's why I call my program New Realities. Duncan Cameron, you have experienced those realms. It has been mind-bending. You've had to adjust to back into a kind of human sphere. Can you talk about that process of encountering and being traumatized in a sense and having to readjust back to this reality? Or maybe... Um, yes, I was uh, um, in a number of research projects back in the 70s and 80s that actually um, created a fixed time loop back into the 40s, which was a experimentation during wartime um, called the Rainbow Project Philadelphia Experiment, uh, where a certain X amount of people were back there in the 40s and in the 80s. And part of the dynamics that happens during a processing out of this physical realm. What I know, there are 12 potentials in this realm that come in and can manifest. There are certain local realities and consciousness that steer this inertia and framework. We're moving in a direction. There's a local collective consciousness. When someone steps out of that collective, there's almost a snapping back. Because it's not allowed. I mean, it's well, it's not allowed. It's because we're all being, we have this elemental part of us that is in our subconscious that the animal is way down in the subconscious, ninth and tenth subconscious, that actually is scanning everyone here, the animal, which is a protective hunker down food sexuality, is scanning here for our safety and health and welfare. So you experience realities that were incomprehensible to the human mind in that sense. In a, in a sense, my training basically was, I was next to a, uh, um, a nuclear detonation device that blew out my psyche. So what was happening linearly in time was happening simultaneously. There wasn't an accounting of what I know of time as movements moving in a particular direction with a reflection back, an accounting of it, and therefore validating this physical existence. I think you just blew out my psyche. When you, when, you, when you don't have as a voice is reflecting off the wall, if there's not a reflection back, there is not an, an accounting of one's existence. So it's an annihilation of ego sense. It yeah, could, could be. I mean, but what, what I'm driving at is this physical reaction, reality in the direction we're moving, we're continually to processing it and helping it. We've actually got to what I know from some of research with Preston Nichols, we're actually out, we've gone through this process seven times all right. We've, as a reality, we back down and we started again. All the records have been erased. Duncan, you've, you've had like 13 ab abductions. Could you just briefly mention some uh, of those experiences? Yeah, um, most of mine having to do with the military. Um, I, I was groomed for a number of experimentations. Um, it had to do with making sure I was online to be somewhat traumatized and abused in order to get to the point where I would accept information and commands without questioning, which is a perfect military person. Right. I, I want to talk about the military, and we'll, and we'll kind of go another round, and then we'll have questions from the audience, but um, I don't know about the MyLab, what they're calling the military abductions. It seems like maybe the ETs can be masquerading as military, because it seems like if they are military abductions, they have to be part of a whole other um, 
arm of the secret arm of the military. What do you, what do you say about the military abductions? I think that there are military abductions, but I, I don't believe that they're taking part as um, an aspect of the formal U.S. military structure. Okay. So when you have when you have in the intelligence community, I think many of us are aware of, in the black budget community, uh, are called special access programs, and a. That's your primordial black budget program, which has little, little to no oversight. And then within that structure, you have what are known as unacknowledged special access programs, which means that they don't exist, but of course they do exist. And um, what we also know is that most of those programs are inc very privatized. So that military personnel are, are not always involved. You've got, and you know, our military has got truck contractors dominating it as, anyway. So within those, very, very deeply clandestine, compartmented programs. This is where I am firmly convinced that there is an e or probably a number of ET-related programs, and I do believe that there are military abductions. Um, my suspicion is that they involve people who are of interest or of value, uh, either in the sense of having had ET contact or in the sense that they have um, Psy capabilities, psychic capabilities that are of value in gathering intelligence. That's why they contacted you for your psychic capabilities, right, Duncan? Was that? Um, well, it, yeah, it, it, in a sense, if one's the protective layers, everyone has protective layers within their mind function that's standardized. You're talking about we have to redefine ourselves, who we are as human beings, and this is the work of Dr. Hurtatz at the Academy for Future Science. So, what so a lot of uh, popular writers have written about the Philadelphia experience, mm -hmm. I, sh I should say, slash experiment. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of apocrypha. People don't know whether this is real or just information by government insiders. Certain experiments did take place, too numerous to go into right now, but getting back to the subject, which is the film, yeah. this is just one of many segments that goes into the great mosaic that we have to see, is unfolding a higher scientific reality. I also include this to include um, ultra-terrestrial, UT intelligence, are so overbearing that uh, the psyche can be fragmented, and this is why it is necessary in some cultures to have a shaman or spiritual guide or um, a person of great sensitivity who can guide the person into the next stage of personal evaluation, personal understanding. We are in this process of interacting with cosmic intelligence, some call the cosmic others. And there are so many different levels and so many different scenarios that are possible. You need a real holistic grounding. And without that holistic grounding, you have mental vacuums. To put it in a few words, uh, the whole definition of scientific truth is being challenged. A whole new ontology of the sciences and the, is the being forged. Is, yeah. Everything is up for grabs. Yeah. Right. And this is Richard's uh, great contribution to really see that there is a systematic control mechanism on some levels so that information does not get into the public commons. And we have to challenge that with better science, quote, future science and uh, consciousness reality. Well, that's what I'm saying. The consciousness has to shift if we're going to accept these realities. And that means the definition of who we are has to shift, because we're not just this linear being, which you know Duncan's experience sort of shows that we're multi-dimensional. That means the definition of who we are has to shift, because we're not just this linear being, which you know Duncan's experience sort of shows that we're multi-dimensional. The whole thing about 2012 was to reorientate us from a solar um, idea of the sun and planets to a galactic understanding. So we are coming into an awareness that we're part of a galactic family. Any comments on that? There has always been a recognition that there is a quote-unquote system of star nations or higher powers that represent uh, a galactic source of intelligence. So I'm not saying there's a a cosmic teletype up there beyond the clouds that just simply issues these directives. But there is a movement to displace extraterrestrial uh, forces that have been injurious to humanity on this planet. We're going to deal with a larger galactic community of any sort, of any sort. We are not even close to being ready when you look at our global politics. You look at the way we treat each other, the way we kill each other, the way we're tearing up this Earth's uh, environment destroying it the way that we are doing. We are clearly unfit. 
we are clearly unfit for a larger kind of interaction. Plus, we're so violent. I mean, any group that's looking at us must think, these people are crazy. So we, we I mean, there's, there's beauty in every side, inside of every human soul. I mean, that's true. But our infrastructure is set up in such a way that we are destroying each other and destroying this world. So what we have to do, I don't think there's any way around this, we have to find a way. Um, to become free among ourselves, but also unified in the sense of recognizing the humanity of each other and treating each other as human beings, not as things. And I don't know how we're going to do that. I think I think a shock of disclosure can start that process. Mm. I, I mean, I, all I can do is I, I think that's a chance, but we've got a long way. We have a long way to go. The key to the whole ET situation are these levels of consciousness, and if it opens us up, if our interactions open us up, the whole humanity is going to shift because reality is not what we think it is. So, right, we're in a time of a great consciousness shift. We can be part of the downward spiral if you want, yeah. to simply dwell on the negative things, or we can be part of an upward spiral mm -hmm. that's taking place, and recognize that we can be co-participants in a new page of the Book of Life. Mm -hmm. I think this dwells deeply within each of us, that there will be changes that will come at the same time we will find in the process of these greater changes that we are one global humanity right. and that we are a universal humanity. We are a friendly species that will be able to use the powers of the mind in a higher sense of spiritual dynamics to reach out and reclaim our cosmic citizenship. Thank you, Dr. I'd like to address the uh, 2012. Um, part of my research is to the different levels of the mind and the psyche, as to conscious, superconscious, down in the subconscious. Um, and part of something back years ago when I was working closely with Preston Nichols, uh, he was helping to deep program some of the fellows in the military. He got down into the fourth level of subconscious and then nothing. They would just get down. It was this brick wall, brick wall. And what we later validated to each other's satisfaction, what I know is the ego denial wall. It's a matter of process of part of us pull down the information to take it out of our face so we can move it throughout the day and get some sleep. Also, the building block of 2012, which has passed, is the same building block as the ego denial wall between the fourth and fifth subconscious. So we That's that. how connected we are, gang, in reality. Mm -hmm. Are you getting this? 2012 is the consciousness between the fourth and fifth level subconscious. 99% of the people spend their time in their mind. The idea is they're off center. Move your body foot, foot and a half and start relaxing, and you are the infinite self. You, everyone here is infinity. So, Duncan, you're saying 2012 marked the place of greater consciousness for all of us. That's that we all move through the past mm -hmm. seven times physically that we've gone, and all our records have been erased. We're moving past that gang. This is extraordinary. Get into your infinite self. Your body is your infinity. Try to relax and replace your body so you can connect up with the higher frequencies off planet, lower frequencies. Figure eight, heart, crosses in the chest here. We're already there, it's just a matter of catching up with ourselves. The question is about fear and how it gets propagated throughout every part of our culture and all the things that you've been talking about in that base level and that ego denial. Because <laughs> Coming up against it time and time again, I realize that there seems to be what I would call a clamp on the memory and the experience and the body sensations. In terms of processing fear, um, I think there's no question that many of the people who've gone through experiences in which they've been abducted, whether by military or by non-human groups, uh, that there is some kind of programming that they've been given where they know they are never supposed to talk about this. There's, whether it's uh, hypnotic commands or some kind of control, that these people, it's, um, you, you get this with people who've gone through military de debriefing. 
where they, they've gone through extensive debriefing and they know they're never ever supposed to talk about it. Even thinking about it is committing a pre-crime. So, so it, I, I wouldn't presume to know what you went through, but I would say that some of the people I've known, I believe they were programmed to be, to be terrified to try to think about this and never to confront it. So what, what you're doing is, is showing a lot of bravery. And I'm, I'm no therapist, so I wouldn't presume that I would, I would, I think that the act of thinking this through calmly and slowly, you take your time, don't rush and think it through. Writing things down is probably the best thing. Um, and you can get some detachment from that. In time, I, I would think that it gets better. One of my late colleagues, Dr. Lavona Stillman in California, had to take people who were uh, um, victims of um, abduction, who were in this, the space research program. He said, she said many of them had this uh, hysteric uh, reaction. They did not want to go deeply into their experience. They were told as if it was an a priori thing put into their brain. Do not speak about this yeah. because things will come apart. So there, there is this uh, psychology of fear and of dualism. We're moving into an age of non-dualism, science and non-dualism. We're moving into an age of ascendancy of a higher consciousness. I would call it spiritual ascension work allows each of us to overcome the negative um, <coughs> scenarios we're facing with positive efforts of constructive thinking, joy, and inner experience. And we must dwell upon the positive with all of the great things that are happening now with the discoveries of our past and great antiquity and our future of working with cosmic civilizations. But I even think going into the fear shows the resilience of the human spirit to overcome all obstacles. So you may be overcome with fear, but there's a part of you that wants to know the truth. And I think that's even deeper than the fear. No one wants to redefine the world. No one. You know, once you've gotten to a certain age, you've got the world figured out, you think, and you want to just spend the rest of your life filling in the blanks. And uh, the problem is that when I first confronted this topic, I, I thought that I was already ahead of the curve. Hey, I've read Noam Chomsky. I knew everything. And, uh, you know, sort of I thought. and then I start getting into this topic, and I thought, I don't know a goddamn thing. And so I, I spent a year, like, in bed, looking at the ceiling, basically staying awake, trying to figure out my world. And it wasn't really a fear. It was just like, there's something wrong with my worldview. And, um, you know, and it's hard. It's very hard to go through that and process that. And I, I do feel that that takes, that is an overcoming of fear, too. There's all different types of fear that we, every one of us has to deal with. It's true. Okay, over there. Uh, yeah, I mean, if this is true, if what we saw here is true, then everything we know about what we think the world is is, is wrong or has to be altered. Okay. The beginning of why some people are more contactees, meaning that it hasn't been a fearful experience rather than an abduction. I think, you can, I think there are a couple things. Like some, some people say that if you are having contact with a certain species, it's because you're genetically related to them somehow. So there might be that kind of interaction. And um, it, I think some of it has to do with what your soul needs in, in order to learn. I mean, if you have like uh, this e extreme trauma and that you can, if you can heal yourself from that and expand that, it's a kind of a blossoming. You know, there's the old saying that you need mud to, to make lilies. I, I think what happens when we do get different experiences and um, why we, some people have a positive experience. I don't have a firm answer, but I, I think that it does, like there are many people who, who will meditate and they're very engaged and elevating their consciousness as, as much as they can. And I have often seen those people have more experiences. It's all anecdotal, can't measure it scientifically, but it looks like that to me. And that kind of makes sense to us, doesn't it? If, if, you, if you get yourself up to a certain level, others will notice you and maybe be more inclined to communicate with you. But are those other beings extraterrestrials? Are they ultra-dimensional? What's the difference? I don't know if they're extraterrestrials or how we even categorize them. What is their relationship to the greys or maybe other physical beings? I don't know. Um, I do think that there's a definite distinction between the, the beings that we typically think of as, as physical, corporeal, greys, insectoids, reptoid-type beings, and so on, and also very human-looking beings. Okay, 
they are physical. They're physical. They may have intense telepathic capabilities, but then you have these seemingly incorporeal entities. This is what we've had shamans for thousands of years. They deal with these types of entities. Are they the same as extraterrestrials? I, I personally don't have that answer, but I think that helps to explain some of the variety of differences uh, that people are experiencing. And uh, the, the last thing I'll just say, since I know we're press your time, is that I, I firmly believe there are many, many topics that can allow the human mind to pry open the layer upon layer upon layer of illusion and lies that are encrusting our reality. Mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be looking into uh, any kind of conspiracies, it could be looking into any kind of occult or esoteric knowledge, but it can also be looking into UFOs, that's what did it for me. That was my crowbar. The key to the whole ET situation are these levels of consciousness, and if it opens us up, if our interactions open us up, the whole humanity is going to shift because reality is not what we think it is. So, right, we're in a time of a great consciousness shift. We can be part of the downward spiral if you want, yeah. to simply draw the negative things, or we can be part of an upward spiral mm -hmm. that's taking place and recognize that we can be co-participants in a new page of the Book of Life. Mm -hmm. I think this dwells deeply within each of us, that there will be changes that will come at the same time we will find in the process of these greater changes that we are one global humanity right. and that we are a universal humanity. We are a friendly species that will be able to use the powers of the mind in a higher sense of spiritual dynamics to reach out and reclaim our cosmic citizenship. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for all of these people. I think if you, it would spin an amazing panel if you, everyone has a different side of, of basically that our reality is much more extended and wider and broader than we're re living it every day. And so I think it's kind of, uh, a, quite a gift just to see that reflected in each of these three panelists to, to, to show us how, how, what we can live into. And, and we have a facility of consciousness that is not what scientists and psychologists have said it is. It is vaster and more multifaceted than we have been allowed to explore. So these people have given us an opportunity to explore it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's hear it for Jane Carmen's film. Yay! Yay.